this here, this mass that's taking up your screen right now, is perhaps one of the oldest laser video disc products that you can get your hands on. That's not a prototype or a one-off. This is the DiscoVision model PR7820 laser video disc player. Now, it does have a remote control. This is a commercial and industrial grade player. So it's built like a tank. It's very heavy and it's very large, but it also has a couple of features built into it, which you really didn't find in any other players at that time and also uh, in players following after that. But in terms of what's before this, really there's nothing. Um, when it comes to laser video disc technology, this is the earliest thing that you can get. Um, and if you're going to say to yourself, uh, how does this play in with LaserDisc? Well, it's the same thing. Uh, consider this the ancestor to LaserDisc. And this player, in fact, even though it's branded by DiscoVision, was actually manufactured by Pioneer. So there's a brand and a name that is very synonymous with LaserDisc. But this, isn't per, uh, this video is not about the manufacturing and history of LaserDisc. This player here is broken. And that seems to be a common problem with all the 7820s, uh, which is quite frustrating because um, when it came to Chrysler, General Motor, AMC, and even into the arcade world with uh, games like Dragon's Lair, uh, this is a very, very, very popular player because you would typically find them um, within the machines and the kiosks themselves. These days, the Dragon's Lair pro uh, project has uh, gone and reduced all of this here down to a much simpler board or adapters to use more modern players. And I've been struggling to get any technical support for this player at all. Like I've asked around, I've had a few people say like, do this or do this. But when it came to actual like detailed troubleshooting, it seems no one knows what to do. And like I said, this player here has a problem. Uh, now I'm going to save you the joy of having to take the screws off the back hinge here and I'm just going to pop the lid off and take it off completely. And the first thing you may notice here is that there's no top clamp. There is no top clamp at all on this player and that is because this spindle here, it's one of a kind and only uh, the 7820 use this. I push these two tabs here and now it's locked the disc in place from the base. There's a rubber cup that lives down on the bottom here and it's just gripping it. And Pioneer actually sold those up until I think about 2009 and then stopped producing them. And what happens to that rubber cup after, what, 40 years now? Um, they break down like rubber typically does. And the result is that you'll try and play it and it'll become a goopy mess. Most people will seem to wrap tape around the post, or in my case, I put a bicycle inner tube in there just to kind of grip it. And as a result, if I spin this up, and I can actually use the remote for this, or I can't because genius me doesn't have the door switch defeated. There we go. You're not gonna play for me, are you? Uh-huh. Oh, there we go. There is no other video disc player on the planet that does that. None. None. Nowhere. Anywhere. And this is part of our problem here. So, I'm going to reject that disc. I'm going to turn the power off and we are going to start opening this player to do some investigative sleuthing here. And if you're following along, please um, leave comments because this is all questions. This is a call for help. I seriously need help and want to get this player working because this is, this is a museum piece at this point here, you know that? So we'll take two screws off and by the way, if you do need service documentation for this, um, I have gone, and there we go, I have gone and all the service documentation for the 7820. 
So the general adjustments, the service manual, the optical alignments, that's all on archive.org. Look in the description below and I've actually included links to those. Um, along with taking the screws out for the door uh, lid here, there's also a battery that lives underneath the player. I've taken that out already. It is leaking, but there was no damage because it sits at the very bottom of the player. So unless you put this thing like on its side or upside down, no problem. So two screws come out and then this cover here with a little bit of persuasion, come on. What are you doing? There we go. There's a bit of persuasion comes off. There is hiding there, a three wire connector for your infrared receiver. Take that off. Now, uh, I don't advocate people try and make themselves go blind, but just to kind of better demonstrate what's happening here, I am going to take the cover off of the laser assembly. And I'm not gonna do it for too long here, but I just wanna show you what happens. So, as you saw, I powered the player up. The safety interlock, which was kind of, you know, defeating me there for a minute, uh, does work. Um, you power it up, it spins up, it's satisfied with the speed, it pulls itself in underneath the laser assembly. Notice what I just said there, underneath the laser assembly. And then it seemed like nothing happened. Or at least for the video display that you cannot see because it's out of frame over here, um, nothing happened. So I'm going to swing this open. There we go. Let me see if I can refocus this. Hold on. Okay, there we go. So the laser assembly is kind of terrifying. We have our Toshiba, our Toshiba helium neon laser there. There's our laser power supply. A mirror, a mirror, and various focusing points. We have our main focusing point to the disc down here. And we have our photodiode, which is actually picking up what bounces back from the disc. I'm going to turn the player on here. So the laser is now on. And from this point on here is my problem. So I'm going to spin the disc up. There's, an app, there's a little gate here that's going to open. I know these mirrors are clean. I have no reason to believe this is out of alignment. And yet... Um, I'm going to spin this up, it'll pull it in, and this focusing element over here is just going to hunt up and down and not actually want to focus. And I don't know why. Play. And you can't see it, but it is hunting the focus right now. And I don't know why. It makes no sense. So it's obviously like the speed is correct, the laser is good, and it's just, it's fighting. I don't know why. Actually, no, it isn't. Oh, I see what's going on here. There. So you hear that clicking? That clicking is indicating that it's like it's slamming itself against the end stop trying to focus, but it can't focus. But the laser's good. We know the alignment is good. I can see a reflection back in the photodiode. You can't right now. I really shouldn't be doing this much longer, so I'm just going to take that out there. I'm going to hit the reject button, and I'm going to power down the player. So we know that mechanically it's working. The laser seems to be working. I have no idea if the photodiode's behaving or if the focus is correct, but I want to focus my attention, no pun really intended there, on the focusing control board itself. So I will unplug the player. I will put this back over again because I do want to protect the laser assembly. And honestly, this is one of the big things. If it is a laser-based or alignment-based issue or a hard physical alignment-based issue, I'm screwed because to realign this and to readjust it requires a special disc. It requires special alignment jigs, none of which are available anymore. So it's basically game over. And I can almost assure myself, even though all this foil tape here is kind of icky looking, 
I was the first person into this player in a long, long, long time. So I'm relatively certain there's nothing inside of the optics that are bad unless the photodiode has failed. So we will put these screws back on. And I will now take this disc off before I damage it. To unlock this, just take the hub that's here and push up and it'll click. And then normally you can just lift it off but because I have the bike tire there and it's slightly the wrong size, it's gonna try and um, get in the way. So I'm just gonna try and bump that out of the way and I'll take the disc off the hub. To get into the four boards that are over here, I do have a group of screws. To get to the CPU, it's under here, which is another four screws. out like that. And our logic's under here. This label here says that it was converted to a Model 3 on January 19th, 1982, so just over 40 years ago from when this video was recorded. And the Model 3 is just uh, the final revision of the 7820, and I believe it is for the most part just a ROM upgrade. Those ROMs, I do believe, have already been dumped. I think they're all, everything, all that's with the Dragon's Layer project. So I'll take out four screws. This protective cover comes off. And then we get into our video display board, our CPU board. Um, what did it call this one again? Uh, D and CR board. Uh, stepper motor control and carriage control, I believe. And because this is a commercial and industrial grade product, the easy to service stuff is just pull out. So let's take the CPU out of here. There we go. And here's our CPU module. And it does use two EEPROMs, um, 8516s. And here's our CPU over here, which is an 8530. It's just a Fairchild F8 that's been rebranded by Mostech. Um, the whole machine is just beautiful in terms of like its module for all of these boards here. But there are some caveats. Um, so all of these boards here are modular and drop in. And I'm just gonna quickly place that one in there for now. But I've had people tell me that the power supply needs to be recapped. That is a problem for me. So there's not a lot of like electrical connectors in here. Besides the back plane and like these connectors here, uh, the power supply is held in with wire wrap stakes all the way along here. Uh, making that even worse, some of those wire wrap stakes are soldered, which means that to take that board out means you're gonna have to completely mess up all of that wire wrapping and all of that soldering and I'm not looking forward to that. Added to that, however, we've already determined I don't want to touch anything inside of this in fear of ruining the alignment relative to the laser pickup and the disc. It does have its own connection here. It is pluggable, and there's three screws inside, here, here, and here. And when I look at the posts from underneath over here, I notice they almost look adjustable which bothers me. You have to take this off to get into the power supply. I don't know how to reach the screws underneath there to even try and pull the power supply out to even check to see what condition the capacitors are in. So to, to save myself screwing myself over, unless somebody tells me otherwise, this is staying in place, the power supply is staying in there. I just wanna go after those boards and the other boards over here, notably the board here at the very end, that is our focus control. And my goal here is that I'm going to go and check the capacitors to see if we have a problem there. And 
What we're going to be doing for checking the capacitors today is we're going to be identifying the brand. I'm going to be identifying uh, their visual condition and I'm going to check their ESR using a tool which has currently been loaned to me. There are a fair number of screws here. lift that over and fold it over using the foil. And I have these two metal retainers here. They're both held in with one screw. And by the way, make it I'm going to make it clear to you. This is not a teardown video. This is again me asking for help. YouTube if you can help me out there, if anyone out there in the world of YouTube can help me with this player, please get in touch with me. I don't, I really don't want to ruin this. And this is the first player I found in the wild after like 15 years when I foolishly had the first one thrown away. Anyways, all that's open up there. So this should be our focus control board here. And again, it's just a pluggable module. And there you go, single-sided PCB. I'm just going to fold that out of the way. And I have a number of capacitors on here. Can I push the player out of the way a little bit there so it doesn't fall down on me? I'm going to go in here for the focus. So this little board right here uh, apparently controls the focusing system inside the laser assembly. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten capacitors, which we're going to evaluate. And to evaluate them today, I'm going to be using the Midwest Devices LLC Capacitor Wizard in circuit ESR meter. I can already hear some people groaning because some people really don't like this device. Even I am really kind of iffy about this. Um, the person I borrowed this from has two of these and the build quality is not really all that great. Different switches, I had one of these meters actually go bad and I had to go in and resolder it. It wasn't fun. But the sheer number of times I've had this um, be right, as opposed to the number of times that it's been wrong, I have to put a little bit of faith into it. That if it says it's good or if it says it's bad, it probably is. If it goes into the compare zone, that's where things begin to get iffy. So I'm hoping not to see a lot of that today. So I'm going to turn this on. And I currently have this set to beep at any point here beyond or below uh, 1 ohm. So anywhere in the good range, if it goes into the compare, it won't beep. If it goes into bad, it won't beep at all. So I will start with this capacitor here. And by the way, let's vi visually identify in this here. This is a 25 volt, 4.7 microfarad cap. Um, actually, most of these seem to be that. Uh, 50 volt, 0.47. 16 volt, 22. These are fairly common values. So even if we do have some bad caps in here, that's not going to be a problem. Uh, leak wise, I'm not seeing any issues here. Smell wise. I can smell the I can smell the phenolic board, but I don't smell fish, and I'm also not seeing any visual signs of leakage here. So let's go with the first cap, and it goes into it's 1.3 ohms on ESR at 100 kilohertz, which to me that puts into the compare. It's the dubious position. Great, we're already off to a fantastic start. 1.5. Uh, do I have to do it from this side? Yes, I will. Okay. Oh, that one's good. Okay, so um, that was bad, bad, and that was good. So that then there is 
a 4.725, and those ones there, I think I said they were 4.725s. 4.725, 4.725. Okay, so we may have issues of brewing here. Same thing. Seems to read weak. Er. The slightly bigger cap here, uh, 2216. That one seems fine. That one reads low. That one I would consider bad. Uh, what was this one? Uh, yeah, 50 volts, 0.47 microfarads. One's good. This one just feels like it's stone dead. Or I'm missing the pin. There we go. That one seems good. That one seems good. Oh. That one's just going into the compare. And that one's just on one ohm. Okay, so there was no smoking gun here, which is unfortunate. I was kind of expecting, like, if we had a cap here that was wide open, um, that would absolutely explain um, why we were having focusing issues. But I'm not seeing that at all. Um, hmm. Okay, so what I'm going to do for the uh, off this video here is I'm going to continue testing all the other boards in this player. Um... These caps, I know for a fact, are 40 years old. It would be good measure to replace them if you want to get the player to be reliable again. But now we have the chicken or egg scenario of what's, what's the first failure? Has it been some other optical issue that's causing it to not um, lock into the disc? Or is it actually a cap issue? Because to buy all the caps for this, and I'm sure there's dozens for them, is going to cost me, I don't know, like $20, $30. And it's going to take me several hours to go through and recap this whole thing. And at the end of the day, because that power supply is underneath that optic block, um, I can't recap the power supply um, unless someone says, no, that's okay, just take the screws out and uh, you're good to go. Um, so if you know more about the 7820 than I do, I will absolutely admit I am no expert when it comes to this. Um, please leave a comment. Please get in touch with me. I would love to get this player going again. Um, it's very, 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 very special. And I do want to make a video out of this at some point because it's really just that neat. And the history behind this player actually comes to lend itself to why Laserdisc exists at all. But that's all I can do. Um, I'm going to continue working with these boards here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching this. Uh, and until next time, have a good one.